Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I guess if we could just start and they can okay. catch up. So, hello everybody. Um, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to meet Mei Chu yet, but um, she's one of our newest uh, faculty members in the Department of Epidemiology in the Center for Global Health. And she's worked w for decades with CDC, WHO, USAID, um, she was really involved in the Ebola outbreak and worked at the White House during that time period. And, um, she's always been interested in developing kind of cutting edge laboratories on the front lines, and that was a big part of the Ebola response. Um, and another big part of that Ebola response was the workers and workers getting uh, acquiring Ebola, and that was a huge problem during the whole outbreak. And now May's uh, become involved in the USAID project to help design better personal protective equipment for the for healthcare workers with Ebola and other similar pathogens. And so she's going to talk a little bit about her work uh, today, uh, focusing on that. Well, thank you. Today. Thanks. So let me take a show of hand. Um, what might be your area of expertise or interest? Let, let's have you finish. Pediatrics. Pediatrics? Okay. Yeah. Emergency management. Okay. Any? We're in global health. Okay. Yeah, so I'm just going to talk a bit about, um, more about, I think, global health sort of policy and negotiation and how we got to where we did to respond to the Ebola outbreak because things were sort of spiraling, um, you know, back around June of 2014, sort of beginning to really spiral out of control. And at that point, um, Everybody's running around saying, we've got to do something, we've got to do something. And then something had to come out the other end so that we could get it under control. And so I'm just going to go through a little bit of the chronology of that. And then I'm going to go through about uh, more detail about this project I'm on with USAID and WHO on designing a new personal protective equipment for health workers. Okay. So, so oh, sorry. First, I want to make sure I give acknowledgement uh, on this particular project that I'm going to talk about in detail. My colleagues are Adriana Velasquez Beruman from the World Health Organization, and she's involved in essential medical devices and innovations. And with Daniel Bouch, who is from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and Dan is. Um, a infectious disease specialist, and he is also what we call the guru of uh, uh, Marburg and Ebola response, because in the field, he's been uh, doing a lot of that work. So one of the things I'll, this is sort of the chronology of what I'm going to talk about, give you a little bit about the Ebola response. The U.S. President's Ebola Task Force in 2014 to 2016, the USAID uh, Ebola Grand Challenge for Development, and then this project that I've been working on, and I'm just dying to finish at this point because it's like, oh, it's been going on for a long time. Um, so quickly for Ebola, it's a biosafety level four agent requiring high containment, but it's a zoonotic disease, and we actually have never isolated, have we ever isolated Ebola from bats? I'm going to ask Darcy, because she used to work there. Uh, I think they're really close. We're close, really close. So they've had uh, nucleic acid signals and in the bat droppings, right, and in serology, but they've never isolated live Ebola virus from bats. So the idea being that it, but it is fruit bats, in, mostly, and um, in Africa, it is a source of bush meat, and it's eaten quite frequently, and they're actually pretty good. Uh, you eat that in South Pacific as well, and, so, and they also have a wide range of uh, flight patterns. So the reason why we haven't nailed it down is because of the wide range of flight, flight patterns. It would seem that Ebola would be almost in most parts of the world, and it's not, and that uh, eating it may be, we don't really know how infective any, if any of the tissue has been, even though it's RNA positive. And so, um, so on the very uh, right side, you see the first micrograph of the Ebola virus in 1976 by Fred Murphy at CDC, who used to be my boss, and then this particular virus was 
uh, cultured from a um, Zaire patient, uh, 1976, a Belgian nun. Uh, and the sample arrived to CDC in broken vials and cracked, and she sort of, pat, sort of fished out the cotton that was soaked with blood and put it in tissue culture and recovered that virus for which they took a picture and which Fred tells me, as soon as they saw it, they, the hair on the back of their necks just rose up because they knew about this from earlier Ebola infections, but they didn't know about this particular outbreak. And because Patricia was the one that did the serotype that clinched that this was a different and new virus, CDC got to name it. You know, and so they named it, and there was a lot of political intrigue on naming it because people didn't want it from that village or from uh, someplace else. So they essentially looked at the map and said, well, we've had two outbreaks here, and there's this river in, running through it, it's Ebola River. So they named it Ebola virus. Okay, so these are all the factoids you all know, right? <laughs> and so then um, the case, so the incubation for Ebola is about 21 days. And um, so that is why when we closed out the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, it is two times, right, three, three times, no, two times the incubation date before you were released from uh, what they call Ebola watch. Uh, this, there's no treatment, it's still supportive, and we do know IV and IV and fluid replacement is important because fluid loss can be up to about four liters a day per patient. And we also know that having the fluid monitored and electrolytes monitored allows you to survive, and also intubation and other dire cases also saves lives. So that's why the case fatality rate towards the end of the 2014 Ebola outbreak was reduced really from 90% down to about 24% if they could do it in places. And it's not um, often where they can serve. Uh, hospitals could do it in West Africa. And we certainly know that uh, where you the places where transmission occurs and the most at risk are health workers, patients, and visitors in, the, in sort of the treatment hospital setting. Hospital setting is sort of loosely described um, as really a, a place where patients came to. And in the communities, of course, was family, friends, gathering places, and funeral practices. Because especially in West Africa and in sort of the Central African belt, the practice of funeral, uh, paying respect to the dead, it requires washing the body, and it requires in some of these tribes to drink the uh, wash fluid or to touch or kiss. And so the explosion of infection really came from those practices and was really community-based. The um, We do have vaccines and antiviral treatment in clinical trials, and there's one vaccine that's come out essentially using the smallpox strategy where you do the identify the patient, you do the ring inoculation to sort of stop the spread. And that seems to have worked well in Guinea. And uh, WHO has uh, taken that attitude when, when the Ebola um, outbreak happens again, that this is what they will do. And post Ebola, there's a lot of psychological, neurological, and a lot of sequelae for the survivors. Because the 2014 outbreak was so large and because it was so of so long duration, we've never had before in previous filovirus outbreaks that we had enough survivors to study. And so we have about 10,000 survivors, and they're being followed through to look at what's happening with them, and most of them have some form of sequelae. Um, let's see, what else? It, what's interesting is that Ebola virus in semen, it's never been thought of as a sexually transmitted disease. It usually was a hospital heavy contact with patients who are, they call wet, who are really ill. So that they, they also, the last case in Liberia, the last, the last sequence of cases in Liberia was sexually transmitted from someone who had recovered from um, Ebola three months prior having sexual relation, and the woman became infected, and then she infected her family and others. And so that was the first evidence, because they had had detected RNA before in semen, but they had not known that it, it could be transmitted. And also, it's actually, this is an older slide, it's actually now almost 
a year, almost two years, that some of these, uh, some of the men who are in the study, the semen is still RNA positive for virus. Okay, the numbers are low, but it's still positive, so you can't say it's not. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, it requires a biosafety level for handling elsewhere outside the natural environment where Ebola is transmitted. So it, it becomes really a tough thing, a tough project to study because it's very expensive. And certainly the Ebola outbreak, I just want to describe a bit, is that it, it was a health security issue more than just the disease. It affected the communities. It collapsed the health systems. The economics of these countries were already poor. They were ranked in the bottom um, you know, of the World Bank rating already, and the corporations pulled out. And most of the corporations in these countries are extractive. There are mineral diamonds and others, and so they just all pulled out. Airlines refused to fly people in, fly people out, and also the ships stopped calling at the ports. And so it really shut down the governments quite a bit. And then, of course, the lack of faith in the government and all this uh, met in a lot of you know um, mistrust and corruption that always goes on in sort of the accusatory tones, no matter how um, dedicated people are to provide service. There's always that specter there. And then certainly in the security during the Ebola outbreak was really tough because they act when distant villages where um, health workers went to ch uh, chase down contacts, uh, we, had, we lost three health workers. They were killed. They were ambushed because villagers just believe that the outsiders are bringing it in, and part of it was cultural, and part of it was because they knew that they, when they took the dead out, they never saw the dead again, which is really tough for them. And the other part was the PPE they wore. They just looked like ghosts, you know, and, and they were not accepted. And so anyway, lots of issues there during the Ebola outbreak. This, these are slides from WHO. I just wanted to share that with you quickly, is that WHO had its own response, then CDC had its response, then France had their response, then UK had their response, then NSF, Doctors Without Borders had their response, Samaritan's Purse had their response, et cetera, et cetera. So it was rather uncoordinated in many ways. But WHO itself deployed about 1,000 epidemiologists. And the number down here that is really interesting for me was when, until they got coordinated and got training in place, when an epi, epi for WHO hit the ground in the country, he or she would have maybe located four contacts for a patient. When they really got things going and connected, they were finding up to 70 contacts per patient, even though the r not transmission is two. So one patient you can transmit to two is sort of the calculation. So you can imagine why it exploded, because they missed so many. They missed 60 or so contacts at a time. Funerals there are essentially you know, uh, hundreds of people joining. And so when you have four or five funerals in a day, you've got all these movement going around. So it was really tough. And um, there was a lot of training. About 7,000 WHO trained health workers were put in place. They also had other countries worried. U.S. was worried, and about 110 countries, WHO had to help to prepare what Ebola looked like and how to deal with it at ports and entry. And I think one of the best things that happened was really taking it 10 years for a vaccine and evaluating 18 months, and that's really good. I mean, this may seem long in the midst of an outbreak, but this was really good. It was a positive outcome. So the other piece is that uh, besides the Ebola healthcare workers, there was a whole massive logistics and procurement mobilization. So this is really 1,000 what we call supply chain people who've never been in disease conditions before, and they show up and they have to ship equipment, ship medicines, ship whatever else everywhere. And they were uh, serving 70 field sites with about 800 Ebola care units. And in a country where roads are difficult, where uh, it's hard to travel, they used trucks. They couldn't really use big trucks. They used low trucks or motorbikes. 
and in many cases bicycles, to get things to where they need it to be and getting patients out with to get treated. And so they also were the team with International Red, Cro Red Cross and Red Cross were responsible for respectful burials in country. And they conducted probably, this is 200 plus, they conducted thousands of burials. So it, it was a heavy load for an organization to take on. And then at home, I'm going to talk a change a little bit. So that was the picture for at the WHO sort of picture. Uh, at home here, we began to take this really seriously around May 2014. And uh, it turned out that we had to have, U.S. government had to decide on two phases. One which was the outward facing for the international abroad uh, response, and then the emergency response that some of you may remember at Texas Presbyterian, where we had an important case of Ebola from Liberia, and then two nurses who were taking care of that, uh, Mr. Duncan became ill. So it, it was interesting because in that venue, uh, MSF had requested the UN right before that, before this happened, to actually ask military intervention. And for those of you who know MSF, that's the last thing that they would do, right? I mean, military and order and, you know, the MSF are a dedicated bunch of individual independent thinkers. They don't like military imprint. But Joanna Liu went to the UN and asked for military intervention because she said it was just out of hand. The MSF could not handle it alone. And so the decision was made uh, in 2014, around May, um, at the White House to coordinate all of US response because it felt like if US government led the way, others could follow because that was something we had to do. And so there were a couple things that we did, which was deployment of medical <clears throat> expert personnel from the military side <clears throat> and the US CDC side. Though numbers are, are not reflected here because it says 170. I think we deployed at CDC in the end about 2,000 some individuals of all different expertise to uh, respond overseas and also uh, domestically. Then the DOD presence was interesting because up to that point, I was absolutely, I, I knew about US troops in Africa and all of us knew about that last year because of, sadly because of the Niger incident. But we've placed about a uh, thousand troops in Africa since about 2004. And they were all pulled in. And then uh, there's a new, we build a hospital for infected workers, I'll come back to that. And then um, the US government went in and built uh, about, I think they completed 15 of the 100 bed Ebola treatment units in Liberia. And, um, but at the end of the day, none, a good majority weren't used because they were put, finally structurally made sound to take patients at a point where it was already March 2016 and we had no more patients. So it, that was not, that, that response was not great. And then the last piece is the community outreach and safe burial. So I talked a little bit about that. So I want to pay, you to pay attention to the fact that the new hospital for infected workers and the community outreach, I think, is what turned everything around. Because without that, we could not have done that. The community outreach and safe burials was the most important part because we stopped transmission up from source. And it was really important to have community buy-in, have everybody sort of uh, agree with you, and then the community leaders and tribal leaders and the well, witch doctors, whatever you call them, medicine pe people, took upon themselves to uh, <clears throat> let people know this is what they have to do. And that's what stopped it, really, at the end. So it's community locally owned. You know, we should have known that. All of us know that. But we just don't do that in the height of fear, in the height of uh, anxiety. We just tend to come in and go, you know. So the other part that was really interesting is the new hospital for infected workers. So what happened was when um, Ebola happened and we knew a lot of healthcare workers were getting sick. And uh, especially if you're from the States or you're from Italy or someplace else, 
there was no place in those three countries that actually could treat you. There was no um, you know, class one hospital. There was no, there was no way that they could do uh, IVs or anything. And so one, and the thing was that thousands had volunteered to go to help. And so we asked how we're gonna evacuate and we assumed that WHO would evacuate those who were ill and fly them back. The WHO says, well, it's International Red Cross. International Red Cross says, no, our um, liability doesn't allow us because the rules are the pilots can refuse. And since Ebola is a patient is considered a dangerous good, pilots have the right of refusal. So nobody would want it to fly anybody anywhere. And we couldn't evacuate anyone. So one thing to do was to build a hospital on site using our Afghanistan and other capabilities and just putting one of those hospitals in Liberia. And the Brits put one in Sierra Leone and the French put one in, in Guinea. And so the, the idea was they were only taking health workers who were sick. So that health workers who volunteered and who went knew that they had a place to go. And then they also, we also then out of the White House arranged for flying them back. So some of those pictures you might remember of Kent Brantley from Liberia and others were some of the first evacuations that we did. But there was nobody in the world that wanted to do it. And each of those saving flights was one individual, one, one airplane, and it cost us $250,000 to fly someone out of the uh, theater there into someplace safe. And we did it not only for Americans, we did it for Italians, we did it for Spain, Spanish, we did it for Nigerian doctors and others who felt who got ill and moved them to Germany. And so we put that in place so that people would volunteer. So I thought, you know, it's something that we don't talk much about elsewhere. The other piece was the Congress was able to give emergency supplemental funding. In the end, it was asked for 6.1 billion, we got 5.4 billion. And uh, that was also a no year, I mean not no year, a five year uh, bulk of money so that you have five years suspended because those of you, uh, you know, dearly engaged in the US government um, systems is that you know, the budget is year to year and it, it expires and that you can never plan ahead. And so the Congress saw to it and gave it a five-year block, which is unusual. And they also ended up giving 5.4 billion, of which 1.3 billion went to the last bit here called Global Health Security Agenda. And that fund runs out 2019, next year. Uh, the current administration, so that's 1 billion for five years. The current administration is proposing 59 million a year uh, to continue some of that work. And I think it's woefully under uh, amount. So I think CDC is announcing that out of the 28 countries, they help out of this Ebola uh, outbreak to help other countries be prepared and be better to respond for the next one. Uh, they essentially have to go from 28 countries down to 10 countries because they no longer can afford it. So. This is an issue right now in Congress that needs to be sort of looked at. The international response was about a billion dollars, and then I mentioned some of the countries already, and you can see them here. So the European Commission was part of it, France, Canada, Norway, Japan, China, and even um, Russia was in place. So you can imagine Russians, so, I point to Darcy because she used to work in this area, but you can imagine a, um, Lab, mobile laboratory unit placed by the Russians next to the Italians. And they both are sort of competing for the same patient group, others, and they none of them had um, coordinated diagnostic tests. They were sort of saying, this one's positive, no, this one's positive, no, that yours is negative, mine is positive. It was really a bit of a zoo until um, WHO was sort of forced to come into organizing all of them. But it, in a way, it was, uh, but the U.S. led by providing the first tranche and you know, sort of brought all the partners together. Um, I think we would have had a lot more trouble. So in the end, one of the things that was, that was really definitely wrong, in a way, was really about the PPE. We, 
the health workers were about 21 to 32 times more likely to get infected by Ebola than the general population where they served in West Africa. And one of the things that they talked about was because of the complication of the PPE that they had to put on and take off. And though there was a study done, there was no causal link relationship between PPE and infection of Ebola, but everyone said that that was a problem. And one of the problems I can tell you is that to put it on took 13 steps, to take it off took 16 steps. At 16 steps, when you're taking it off, you're really tired, exhausted and you just may not do well. And so we think that that's really high risk. And so in the midst of all that, uh, there was also this huge ethical uh, argument about can you do research in the midst of an outbreak? There's always these different schools of argument, one of which was it's not ethical to do research when you've got patients dying, you've got to deal with the patients. But also the other side of it is that if you don't study and, and look at what you can bring to where the epidemic is to improve the epidemic response by doing clinical research, you never know because you can't simulate it in a BSL-4 lab. You can't take it out of that context. So there was a lot of argument and in this particular piece in this Ebola outbreak, the agreement was made by WHO and all its partners that in the future, it is ethical to conduct clinical research in the midst of outbreaks because uh, you need to do that uh, and show and because gaps and crisis happened every day and everybody was making decisions not based on science but based on how I felt for that day and it then became more and it became a problem to sort of untangle what was really relevant what wasn't and so what so one of the questions out of where I was working um, in DC was that, you know, can innovation ingenuity be brought to bear to deal with speeding up vaccine and treatment trials? And WHO did adopt one of the recommendations and that was successful. You know, provide more than just supportive care to patients to save them, solve the supply chain issues. And healthcare workers, we said we're at greatest risk, we have to do something. So the other previous slide that I showed you with WHO, we probably deployed about one and a half million sets of PPE. And so from this point on, I'm gonna talk a lot more about PPE. I want you to notice in the pictures how many different kinds of PPE were sent to the field. And thereby, that is the problem. So one of the things we did was, they said, May, you have to do a hackathon. I go, what the heck is a hackathon? Does anyone know what a hackathon is? Okay, I, I thought, well, I mean, somebody's gonna break into my computer. And you go, no, it isn't. And so the Silicon Valley type colleagues at the White House said, we'll deal with that. You just get the science people there. So what we did was we brought together about 140 uh, persons from different walks of life and uh, to address this problem, which is what hackathon is. You come and hack at this problem, and the problem was solving the PPE conundrum for, uh, uh, for the field response for the healthcare worker. And what we did do was Dan Bouch is at the top here, showing the, in the green outfit, the WHO preferred PPE outfit. Sitting at the table, which also the reason is we want to dress up volunteers in the MSF PPE, which is much more uh, covered and um, in an air conditioning room. So it doesn't really, they were able to uh, last longer than the 40 minutes that typically is PPE wear in hot, humid conditions. And they looked at what things, what problems on the donning and the doffing step you could deal with to resolve problems. And so we then went into what we call the maker space where there's 3D printers and uh, sewing machines and steel metal printers and, and so forth and work together. So in this picture up here, we have um, Rob Shaw, who was the USAID administrator at that point. And the team that I work with behind him on the side is Wendy Taylor, who leads the USAID team called the Center for Accelerating Innovation and Impact. And then amongst this group is a defense department guy who does nothing but design PPE for the war theater. We have also a wedding dressmaker. We have a Parsons School uh, of Design who is a fabric 
um, manufa uh, designer, manufacturer, and then we have at the back standing the NASA guy who does the spacesuits for flights and space stations, coming together to sort of figure out what we can do about the PPE issues. So what came out of that? So what they came of it was that out of that um, $5.4 billion you saw earlier, a part of that, about $22 million came to this grand challenge, a la Gates Foundation grand challenge on fighting Ebola, and the Center for Accelerating Innovation and Impact led the way in trying to fit, uh, get ideas and innovative ideas and research to the field during the Ebola outbreak. And this happened in October, uh, November 2014, and that activity, one of the activities still remains with me. So what happened was there was a large call wide across U.S. government, across the spectrum, and um, we're looking for ideas like information technology. We're looking for ideas for personal protective equipment. We're looking for how to improve care setting and decontamination design, looking for healthcare worker tools and behavior change because, again, this is a community-based behavior change that needed to happen. So about... In a month's time, which is what this uh, call challenge was open, about 1,500 ideas were proposed, and USAID funded 14. And I'm going to give you a few pick, uh, uh, run through a few of them. So one of the first things was, if you look on this side here, in the Ebola treatment unit, and this is in Liberia, you can see how IV was administered when they could. And essentially, they had no IV poles. You had to have somebody holding it and really counting the drips. And you can see the, the patient is really quite ill and quite infectious at this point if he were Ebola positive um, because in every volume that he emitted or uh, discharged, he had about uh, 100 million virus life virus particles per amount. So that's heavy duty infection. And so Ebola is not easy to get, but when you're in that proximity and all that is coming at you, you're gonna get contaminated. So the drip assist, which is now FDA approved, is essentially a 3A battery unit that just clamps onto the IV uh, feed, feed and it just regulates it. And you can then put this on a bulk IV uh, uh, service and it essentially monitors the whole ward for you if you needed to. And that helped a lot because they didn't have enough healthcare people to go around changing bags. Essentially, they had three people in some of these units when it was heavy. Essentially, when they could put IVs in, they were changing bags this way, coming back and changing bags this way, coming back, going back and changing bags. It was pretty dramatic to have that happen. And um, this one's one of my favorites. So so essentially, the um, disinfectant use is chlorine, hypochloride, and it is essentially household bleach diluted one to a hundred. And uh, so that's pretty easy, but, but it also oxidizes quickly when it uh, touches protein, which is what a lot of the patients were screening was full of protein. So its effectiveness disappeared very quickly and also to sunlight. And so what Jason is from uh, Stony Brook, New York, he was second year chemical chemistry student in the university. He just put color added feature to the chlorine. It essentially fades upon light. So when you know it's faded, its effectiveness is gone, you have to reapply. And, it, and it's now used in many hospitals. He's actually got a whole business now. And he's a businessman. And when I first met him, he was probably about 18 years old. Uh, he's now 21, and he's in suits and looks pretty sharp. But um, he's, he's got a business for it. The other part was on here was in places where there was no electricity, you, the heat was stifling. So McCarrick. Uh, out of Uganda and university students designed a uh, Ebola treatment unit that essentially uses not cold air, it's cooler air coming in and hot air, warm air going out. So to help with circulation because it was really hot in those um, in treatment units. And then the other part of it was really social mobilization. This was probably the most successful part of it. There were skits, there were songs, there were raps. And part of it because it most of the um, population is uneducated. They don't read. So you give them out pamphlets. 
it doesn't really help. Um, songs and jingles help. Um, there are also local dialects and also cultural habits that they could address. So another one of the, the innovations is, so uh, coupled with what I was explaining about what Jason did with the colorized uh, um, leech, is that this is how it was applied in the field and was sprayed. And if you were contaminated and you were sprayed before you had to take your PPE off, essentially you spread it all over the place because um, it's a hand pump. You, you, you have probably done it for weeds around here. Um, it, it just was not very effective. So one of the innovations was where they could, they put in a passive uh, mist unit that you can walk through to get decontaminated rather than being sprayed. And then another was by another student, high school student, who you know, did this work. And then this was picked up with uh, Under Armour and with um, the baby monitor makers. I forget the name of the company that makes them for baby monitors. And essentially, it's a device. It's a Band-Aid that you take across your heart. And what it does is it measures your temperature, the skin temperature. It measures your, your um, uh, moisture content. And if the health worker wearing the PPE reaches core temperature, it buzzes. It just you know, zaps you, actually, and you have to get out. Because one of the first things that they end up having to do when you first deploy, especially if you come from climes where it's used to air conditioning, is that most healthcare workers and most doctors and nurses are intent on providing care. They're so intent on providing care in ETU, they actually pass out because of the heat. And basically, yes, somebody has to put PPE on, go and drag them out. And so this was sort of to let them just know where they are. So there's a lot more innovations not connected to that, but I won't get into it today. The last, uh, oh no, next to the last piece of innovation is taking uh, shipping containers and putting, making them into Ebola treatment units. And this is from Baylor University. So this, this unit in the middle is actually now deployed in Liberia in several places. And one of the places that they're using this for is for maternal uh, healthy child clinics uh, because they don't have any of the facilities in their own hospital. So this comes equipped with all the hooks up, hookups and things and um, capabilities, and it opens up this way. And that if you need it to, you can adapt it into a Ebola treatment unit you know, if that uh, happens. So this piece, then I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes just talking about this. The current protective equipment, this is the MSF outfit, which essentially is covered. So I hope you're noticing all the different kinds of PPE we're showing you. And essentially, is, it's, here is 31 steps to doffing. And the innovation that was funded with uh, 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 Johns Hopkins is the eight step. And the eight step essentially is this little vignette here, which you can't see, is that, you know, theatrics, and we said we have the Parsons School design people, and you have theater design people too. When actors and actresses on Broadway plays have to get out of their outfits quickly, what do they do? They actually have what is self-splitting um, zippers. So what they did was they put that on the back of the uh, PPE outfit so that essentially when you have to disrobe, you disrobe from the back and not the front because basically your whole front mucous membranes, eyes, ears, nose, and wherever you touch in your mouth area is most susceptible to Ebola infection. So you can now disrobe by pulling on a tab and go like this and the whole thing pops out and they've got the, this now sort of on an you know, old-fashioned um, clothesline, if you remember, where they hook it up to the, so they undress, hook up clothesline, somebody does a clothesline and pulls it away, and the health worker steps backwards into a decontamination pit. So the idea is to just move it. So they can actually, not eight steps, but do it almost in three steps now. So, so, the, so what happens is that the, off-the-shelf PPE that you see was designed for mostly protecting the patient from getting infected in the surgical theater. And it was never designed to protect health workers. So we have to reverse the whole engineering part of it. And that was whatever is now on the shelf that you see in the hospitals, each has its certification true. Each is certified against a particular purpose and function and design. But none of it was ever put together into one single outfit to see how it protects because one design can work against the other, and I'll show you in a minute. 
And so that's one thing. And there's no research done on this because you know, when Ebola outbreaks on, everybody goes home, everybody's busy, they forget, and nothing is done. And so one of the things that I'm working on is really trying to get a consistent approach to test a single PPE ensemble. So what WHO did was this, was they were highly criticized for the, their response to Ebola. And out of the reform, um, a group was created called the WHO Advisory Committees for Innovative Personal Protective Equipment. Um, I serve as their uh, secretariat for this group, which means I'm the chief cat herder. I just get everybody together. And I work with about 80 people from around the world, nine time zones. So somebody gives up dinner and somebody else gives up their sleep in the morning in order to talk. And basically, we had four groups looking at Ebola virus and transmission. This is mostly the BSL-4 labs. We looked at uh, infection prevention, control, and occupational health safety issues. There's a lot of technical specifications, like, as I just mentioned, that actually don't come together. And countries and regions have different rules than other countries and regions. So they're sort of clash with each other. And the manufacturer makes PPE for Japan, which cannot be used in Morocco because the rules are different. And so during the Ebola outbreak, everything got shipped to WHO as a donation from these wonderful governments with good good intention, but we couldn't pull it all together. So then we looked at what actually scientifically validated studies on PPE, and that was really challenging in some ways, and not as the others, because there were not that many, but then there were many strongly held beliefs about this is the only way to do it. I know this is the way it saves lives. And then when you look at the evidence, it's not there. Okay, And then, so we synthesize all this information to come out with this document that I hope will be published shortly. It's called The Characteristics We Like in the PPE. And of this group here, you can't quite see it, but on the far right are two young doctors, one from Guinea, one from Liberia. Uh, the one from Guinea, he was a, what do you call, a uh, young practice doctor, which meant that he was just out of his fourth year of medical school, and he was put in charge of all the whole Ebola outbreak, because he was one of the few doctors there. Okay, next to him is a young uh, boy who is one of my, uh, he calls me up almost every other day now. Uh, he was a military doctor in Sierra Leone, also brought in because all his chiefs died. Uh, several layers above him, they died of Ebola. And he was sort of left standing. He goes, okay, I'm it. And so he sort of stepped up. And so he and others who were PPE users, along with Trish Pro, who's the gray haired with glasses person there from University of Southwest Texas, who was the past president of IDSA and uh, you know, infection control specialist, and so from Mike Bell and the Thai uh, from CDC and et cetera, were all sort of, and um, two nurse practitioners sitting there who deliver babies during Ebola. So we all came together to figure out what those 10 characteristics need to be. And they're essentially grouped into design feature, material performance, and desirability. User of desire. I'll go through some of those with you because um, the idea is that we're, there's no standards to any of these. There's no system to any of this. So what we're trying to do is build that system based on these characteristics. So first things first is that the mucous membranes must be protected, which means your eyes are very important. So whatever you do on doffing, your eyes have to be covered to the last, right? But look at the MSF. I don't know if you can see, but you see the others. They've got the goggles on the outside. When they start doffing, what goes off first? So that's a problem. Um, you look at their shoes and wear. Now, some of these have told me that in these outfits, when they finish their shift, they take their boot off, which is reusable. They dump it out. They've got a, about 100 mLs or so sweat in there because they just sweat all the way through, and there's no place to go but drain to their feet, okay? Uh, you look at some of the sizing differences. You know, that's really a difficult challenge. So the wedding designer actually has a very good system, and she sort of designed baffles, you know, some of those things that we use pinching, and you can actually do that to accommodate for some of the sizes. 
So this is also, so let me just tell you, this is the innovation from Johns Hopkins that met our requirement that you have to protect mucous membranes, you have to reduce fogging, and you have to increase visibility because when you are covered like this, you can't see, patients can't see you either. It's a culturally offensive feature. But this picture here, if you see the pink at the bottom, it's got rough edges. It's a plastic shopping bag that's been torn aside and put in as a hood because they had no others. He's got an N95 respirator on, but his goggles are way too big for his head, so it sticks out at the side. And you can't see it in this picture from afar, but he's just fully bearded with sweat, right? And you can't tell if it's a man or a woman. Oh, sorry. So this one on this side is you have visibility, it sits, and when you doff, you can see now, when, when you doff, the goggles don't come off first, the whole thing comes off. And um, there's no fogging because you've got a one-way valve here where you, when you exhale, it just exits out this way so it doesn't fog. And you can have a better vision of what's around you. So fogging, that's another picture of fogging you can see. Um, junctions leak, you think that you've got things snapped up and everything's good, but what they have done is when they do a fluorescent spray after you doff PPE, after you've treated a patient, you see that you've got just Ebola-laden material all the way through your gloves because the junctions are crinkled, they're not smooth, they're not designed to be together. And you can see dear Ruth here, she actually has two different kinds of gloves on. And what she did was contextually make it culturally acceptable. She put her picture on the front and says, I am Ruth, because you can't quite tell that that's Ruth. Okay. And she also has her goggles on properly, which is the hood is over her goggles. So the hood goes first, then the goggles come afterwards, right? So there are things that they did on site to help themselves. So these are the advice that we receive from all the different people who use PPE to advise us of how to fix it. Reusable pieces is the boots and some of the rubber gloves, especially for burials and heavy cleaning and on the Ebola work because patients excrete vast amount of virus, have to be cleaned, they usually cleaned in hypochloride, chlorine, and it's toxic. And um, even though the cleaners are asked to wear the mask and protect themselves, it's just so hot, they just take it off. So it doesn't work very well. So we need to have some other way of doing this. So what are we trying to do? Our goal is now by 2019 to bring to market a person protective equipment system that fits, that's tested against Ebola, and, or it's a uh, simulant if we can. And there are uh, researchers in BSL-4 uh, labs working on comparative simulants so that we can take the testing out of the BSL-4 lab into a testing site that's, uh, that allows us to uh, track and trace where contamination may happen. So we need to do that. We can't do it alone. It needs a whole bunch, needs a village, it needs a whole village to come together to sort of look at how we fund it, how we prepare it, how it's gonna be used and distributed in the future. So the challenges ahead are, there's 10,000 or more survivors that suffer from sequelae that need attention. We have the long-term sequestering of live virus and semen. So as I said, it's been like almost two years. And it, so it's longer than this uh, statement here. Um, those who survive Ebola are shunned by their communities because they're afraid of them. They don't know, they don't welcome them back, which led to the finding of about 4,200 some orphans that had no homes to go to. And most of these are young babies, like at the top picture, the MSF, where the mother has died. The baby may have had Ebola, may have survived, and um, nobody knows who they are because when they took the patients from the villages, they just ex you know, extracted them without any documentation because in the hurry of doing the Ebola control, a lot of things were not done ethically. And so uh, at the bottom picture is just uh, Sylvie Blyden, who's one of my heroines in this, some of this Ebola outbreak. She is the minister now of 
social welfare and gender and children's welfare. But she heads the Ebola survivors group. She's got two of the uh, Ebola survivors with her, and they're working at the UN and with World Bank, uh, with Jim Kim, who's in the middle there next to Sylvie, uh, to sort of sustain the uh, need to care for these patients in the long term and care for these orphans in the long term and to also improve the health systems. And um, we also, they're also talking about giving access to vaccines and treatments. And the question always been, you know, Ebola could return any time. What, what are we going to do next? And this, some of you have seen before, um, it's very personal for me. And I take on this project because I lost friends. Um, I, I was working for, from CDC. I was seconded to the WHO. And the first thing I did was they sent me out to deal with the Lassa fever outbreak in Sierra Leone. Dr. Conte, who was the chief physician there, had died uh, Deliver, trying to help his infected nurse deliver her baby, um, and they all died. And when we walked in, the maternity ward and the pediatric ward was just decimated. And nobody had been there for days. It was my first sort of experience. I went, oh, okay, that was hard. So we did build a Ebola, uh, while we built a Lassa fever service in uh, Kenema, Sierra Leone, and while we were there, Humar in the middle came in. He says, I just graduated from University of Ghana. Here's my medical certificate. I hear you're looking for a doctor. He had just passed away. He says, I volunteer. So he was hired, and we trained him. He died in June 2014 of Ebola. Along with him are some nurses and other doctors. And this nurse, Mabalo, was in, uh, the chief nurse. And... Um, you know, I owe her a special debt because when I first got to Sierra Leone to deal with this Lassa fever outbreak, she goes, first time in Africa, right? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she goes, I'll take care of you. And so she had been sort of my shining star. And every time that I would go back, she would take me out and, you know, show me. And she introduced me to the community. So it's important. And then Siddiqui up on top was a lab technician that I worked with a lot. And so, I mean, they all died from Ebola. So to me, this is... Uh, also a mission that I wanted to make sure that gets happened because they died because they didn't have any PPE. And off the PPE they had, there were garbage bags and there were bags on their feet and that's how they died. So anyway, I'm almost there. So last thing, do you guys know what this is, picture is? To be a little more delightful. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I did with American Society for Microbiology as a member was we started this program called Petri Dish Art. So these are Petri dishes, and this is all, and they're given a clear auger, and they're asked to be creative. And so this is different bacteria and fungi and others that you can paint. And other lectures in the future, if I have a chance to come before you again, I'll show you the Van Gogh paintings. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, any questions? Let's yes. talk about what the current uh, status of the vaccinations are. Okay. You know, the FDA or whoever fast tracked the development, and I understand there's a pretty efficacious vaccine. Is that becoming a standard, or where does that? Start? So there's a lot of uh, issues around the vaccines delivery. So I think the world has agreed that in a humanitarian case, in case Ebola happens again. WHO will have access to the NIH stock for free distribution, and it would be provided in a way um, if the surveillance is, has to be really, um, uh, the spray system that they promote now has to be initiated. And what they'll do is use a smallpox strategy where they have a case and then they do the ring um, vaccination around to save the vaccine, and because by the time you're infected by, and to the time that you are excreting the virus, there's usually around uh, less than two, I mean, the shortest has been two days, but generally it's enough to get kickstart your own immune system. And so that's the agreement. Short of that, who's going to make it, who's going to provide it, who's going to stop pilot, except for NIH, there is a lot of discussion because the vaccine dose itself if it's, and when it's made by the commercial entity, they want to charge about $6,000 a shot. 
to recover their costs. But NIH paid all the research, and WHO paid the research. So don't get me started on that one. Just, um, just a quick question there. Do you know who's that a DNA vaccine? Uh, there, they have field tested one, and um, it has some promise, but it's locked in Liberia right now because there's no patients. They can't do any field trials. It's past uh, phase one and phase two, but the phase three is awaiting patients. So one of the things that we're doing now in the downtime before the next Ebola outbreak is to get all those uh, clinical trial uh, agreements in place and be able to roll it out. We'll see. We'll see if that works. Thank you. Have they thought at all about cooling systems for, or like for individuals working at Ebola? Yeah, systems? so we did, like right? Yeah, good idea. Good, good point. So we did. We funded two of them in this Ebola Grand Challenge. And what we had were these ice packs that you just whack, you know, they just seem like for emergencies, and you can just put them in specific places, and you have a vest that you can put them on. Um, so one of the problems was recharging them. There's no electricity in some of these places. The other thing that was really surprising to us was we thought about air cooling systems and vests and other kinds of cooling you know, systems, even um, you know, what they call powered air purifier systems, is that the locals who live in those West African countries refused it because they're so used to being warm that being cold made them sick. And so we're gonna to have to sort that out in the next round. You know, hopefully it's not so huge, but to do that. So some of it's being used right now in the loss of fever outbreak in Nigeria, because they've got about thousands of cases of, of uh, loss of fever in Northwest Nigeria. And the feedback is that they don't like the cooling system. They'd rather be hot, so mm -hmm. go figure. <laughs> Are, are these, um, sorry to interrupt, we do have a class that's coming in at 1 o'clock, which is why the class okay. is opening. Um, so thank you all very much for coming, and thank you, Dr. Chu. Okay. You're welcome. Okay.